Alrighty, guys, welcome back to the MindMate podcast. This show in particular is a long time coming. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely really, really excited about it. I almost can't contain myself, actually. Um, I'm sitting here with Margaret Ross. Marg, how are you? I'm very well, and it has been a long time. We've been trying to do this for months, if not over a year. So I know. good to finally connect and chat. I know, I know. Look, COVID, COVID has probably done that for lots and lots of people out there. So I don't think that you are, you and I are alone in this. We we actually had this plan to do it um, in person in in the beginning, mm. but uh, then I moved out to the sticks. <laughs> yes, you did. Do your listeners know where you've moved? Yeah, well, I've uh, I've moved about an hour east from Melbourne, so we're in Warrigal now, and uh, yeah, we 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 love it out here. It's it's just beautiful. You said you're from the country as well, hey. Originally, yes. So, but other side, kind of okay. Grampians region, oh, small beautiful. country, so the Wimmera area, and um, yeah, grew up in a very tiny place. Yeah, tiny, tiny. Um, yeah. So then, country girl decided to you know go to uni, and I've been here ever since. So, but I kind of live on in, in the hills surrounding Melbourne. So, oh, beautiful. That's a fresh area. So I'm kind of a country girl again. Yes. Kind of. Yes. Yeah. It's good to, you know, maybe what not everyone will resonate with this, but having that balance, you know, for, for me, um, out here is, is just city enough that I have access to, you know, my little pleasures and whatever I need, but just country enough that I can still see the stars at night. Oh yes. Yes. Now in, in one, you've just summed it up perfectly. You can, you can have a degree of anonymity if you want, cause you're close enough to the city. You can yeah. kind of do all that stuff, but also you, you've got, um, yeah, nature at your doorstep and it's beautiful and you can see the stars and, you know, yeah. So I, yes, I completely understand. Yeah, it's, it's huge, it's huge. Now, look, I, I came across you, uh, Mark, because I was I was really interested in uh, psychedelic research um, for, for therapy, you know, for, for anxiety and, and all this. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot going on in, in the US and in Canada, as you were actually telling me before the show. And I think even in Europe as well, um, this is getting a lot of attraction. Uh, a lot of traction, but I, I wanted it to to be at home, and I wasn't seeing a whole lot until I came across you. So, um, why, why don't you give the listeners a, a brief introduction as to who you are and what you do? Because they're not always the same thing, of course. But uh, and then and then how psychedelics kind of fits into all this. Sure. So I'm a, a clinical psychologist. I work at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, and um, I work specifically in cancer care and in palliative medicine, um, and have done for gosh, nearly over a decade now. So, um, and then probably the last nine years at, at St. Vincent's. So I, um, I'm just trying to think about where, where it all sort of, sort of yeah. intersected. I guess it, for me as, as a clinician, I'll talk from, from there and then I'll, I'll move into to how it kind of all connected into psychedelic medicine, but um, dealing obviously with my patients who have um, terminal illness, um, I tend to largely work uh, at the end of life. Mm. And um, there were people that just weren't responding mm. to our usual treatments. So, um, yeah, you know, our usual treatments being medication or being talking therapies or creative therapies and so forth. And, and some did, but but there were some that really didn't and they were just um, they were terrified and uh, really distressed. And, and it was quite, um, you know, I use this word all the time and it sort of feels like I'm flipped, but it is, it was heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking mm. for the staff. It's heartbreaking for family. Um because you just feel so helpless, there's really mm. nothing that can really touch this. We we try and get around that person, but they they really just suffer this psychological and existential anguish that we just can't access in any way, um, and it really robs them of that precious time that they have got left with their families and loved ones. So I was looking for emerging treatments, definitely, but um, but I had heard about what was going on in the US and with the psychedelic research renaissance in 2016, in particular, there were two papers that were produced uh, by Johns Hopkins and um, NYU. And if any of your listeners have heard or, or followed any psychedelic medicine, they'll know who Roland Griffiths is. He's a big guy now. Um, and I think um, uh, mentioned also in, um, um, oh, God, I've drawn a blank. What was the big, the guy, the, the journal? Michael Pollan. Oh, my gosh. Michael how Pollan. did I forget him? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, uh, I went and saw him live, actually. So uh, that that's, his name is etched into my brain. But, yes. <laughs> And he knows of our trial and he's a support. It was wonderful. Um, so he dropped his book at a very opportune time as well, mm. I have to say. So basically, going back there, I'd heard about it in 2016 and went, someone will bring this to Australia. Surely someone will bring this. And I was ready to kind of ferry 
my own patients, even just in my private practice, because I was seeing also um, people who had end of life um, issues and mm. concerns in my private practice as well. And I thought this would be so beneficial for them um, because of the rapid and dramatic improvement that could be, you know, um, achieved within such a short time. And um, and remembering that people who have terminal illness don't have time. So mm. we have to be mindful of that too. Um Anyway, waited, waited, nothing happened. <laughs> um, I, I had heard about how there were there was sort of a growing interest and I'd been keeping up with, I'd heard about the EMDMA PTSD work as well. Um, so, you know, these were big things that were happening in psychiatry, you know, so you couldn't look away and you're like, oh, what's going on here? Um, and it was really exciting. So I had signed up to go and see Rick Doblin came to Australia um, who Again, if your listeners know, he's the head of MAPS and, and um, has been championing um, MDMA as a therapeutic agent for about, oh, God, since 85, I think. So he's really been in the game a long time. And he came to speak, uh, Ben Sessa from um, the UK, and they were talking about their, their research. And I was hoping someone would be there sort of to talk about some psilocybin, but one of the, and this is quite pretty pivotal, I went there to sort of listen and see where things were at. And um, and then Martin Williams from PRISM got up and did a talk about the state of psychedelic research in Australia. <laughs> And said, "Okay, so here it is." And the next slide was the end. Oh. And there was, a, and, yes, and the whole the crowd just erupted. It was like everyone's pissing themselves laughing. But oh. at the same time, he, you know, and he still was like, "Thank you for your attention." It was like, "Oh, shit. like really, we're not doing anything." So, and then there was these sort of rousing talks, like wonderful. It was um, through Enterogenesis Australis um, that are you know an incredible kind of community of different people from various different walks of, uh, you know, and, and they'd put on this incredible symposium and it was just amazing in art, music, this, that, that, and then the, the research and the science of the, the plant medicine. And, um, yeah, so at some point Ben Sessa was giving this really rousing talk about if you have a way of being able to do this, and it was kind of like looking at, you know, if you have a way of it, and I'm like going, oh, and I've got this knot here that was sort of going, oh, shit, yeah, I could, I could maybe oh god it seems like it's such a big thing but but then a decade prior to that this is in 2017 a decade prior to that I'd just graduated from my doctorate and was working as a as a research fellow and prior to that even and I'm old now be the math um, I was working in clinical trials so I knew how clinical trials were run I knew how to set them up but I'd left that behind because I'd really missed all my clinical work so then all of a sudden I went all right I'm gonna give this a go <laughs> my hat in the ring and and because I would just was desperate to see if we could bring this to our patients and and um you know I was really fortunate I reached out to prison Martin was invaluable prison were fantastic um in helping us you know securing some funding to actually sort of kick us off um and then um yeah I spoke with head of palliative medicine said how about it he said yeah I've heard of this research I'm, I'm supportive um went to the ethics committee and I thought I'm not going to go in cold because I heard some horror stories <laughs> so I wanted them to know what was happening um and then spoke to my co-principal um Dr Just Justin Dwyer who's um also my co-lead um uh, therapist with me and um yeah it was it wasn't a hard sell when I showed people the science it was mm. really not it sort of spoke for itself and then you know as they say it sort of it just sort of went from there Michael Pollan dropped his book in May that year we just sort of worked on this protocol and then submitted it and we got conditional approval first hit which was stunning to us I think um but in saying that you know you do go um on the shoulders of the people that have come before you and I, I really you know hats off to all the people who did all that the pioneering work again you know in mm. you know 90s 2000s to, to get it where it was it just made our job that much easier still was difficult terrain but it's um we just didn't get the pushback that we, we thought and had anticipated. So then, yeah, it was announced and we were very prepared for negative, lots of criticism and we're, we'd been fine-tuning our arguments and, and the opposite happened. It went berserk. It went absolutely berserk and we had such an outpouring of positive feedback and the community, the swell of interest and, and, and support was just um, we didn't, expect that at all and um and since then I have to say life has changed I, um daily getting 
inquiries from people who are interested as, a, as researchers, as your know, patients, and people who want to access this, um, people who want to volunteer, who want to come and learn with us and, and um, venture capitalists. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's, it's just been phenomenal how, how this has really tapped into our psyche, our mm. cultural psyche. Um, and I think, you know, it's, um, it was a really interesting indicator, like a litmus test of where, how our cultural psyche has shifted now into a, you know, a, a space where we're much more embracing of um, psychedelic medicines and compounds. Um, so, you know, that those hangover effects from the counterculture movement and the political propaganda and, you know, blah, 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 which is a whole other podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it sort of, that kind of fizzled out and, and we just found ourselves getting a hell of a lot of interest and, um, and, it's, and it's not stopped at all. And, yeah, hopefully we're, we're going to see some more trials being announced over the next few months, which is great. Mm. Um, so this is, yeah, good news. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing story. I think, and, you know, especially what you see in response to the counterculture movement in the 60s and, you know, early 70s perhaps even, well, I think Barbara Hoffman was doing it even earlier, but, you know, you basically, it, it all gets pushed underground because it's all made illegal and all these people grow up, but they're, they're incredibly open-minded now. They've had these incredible experiences, you know, completely changed the course of their lives. They have children, they, they're, they're raising their children in very, very different, much more progressive ways because of these the experience they have when they're young. And then now when, when all this research is coming up again and, and science is really almost cementing some of the positive benefits of it all these people are coming out now with and, and yeah. the rise of social media and technology saying hey yes i'm all for it this is amazing you know so it's um it's incredible work it's you know it's incredible work you're doing i actually have a question before we get into psychedelics what what drew you to working with terminally ill patients because that that is a lot of weight that one has to carry you know and that's not a direction that not every kind of clinical psychologist goes down. So I'm just interested in what, what drew you there. Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. Um, thank you for asking. I, I, I often think our, our little, our terminal ill are sort of underrepresented in lots of ways. So mm. look, I think it, it sort of, I guess some, oh gosh, here's another podcast for another show. <laughs> I, I, Let's um, get you back on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, look, I think I, 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 I lost my, my nan, my maternal grandmother, um, very young and she was very dear to me and I lost her at a fairly formative age, I think. So kind of made me interested in the concept of, of um, dying. And funnily enough, and because I'm from a, you know, a small country town, I was fairly, you know, and, and sort of older sort of ways, I guess more conservative ways of, of, of is very different now, but children were very kept away from death. Mm. And that made me curious about it from a very young age. I didn't understand why, um, and I felt, gosh, so wouldn't wouldn't they be lonely? Why are people staying away from them? So, so you know, mm. this is my seven year old, eight year old brain going, why would why would you you know you don't leave people alone if they what if they're scared? You know, so and so and then honestly, those questions kind of stayed with me and haven't really left me. Um, then yeah, I guess doing my doctorate, I lost my mum, uh, so she had um, a respiratory illness that ultimately. Um, she succumbed to back in 2005. So, oh. um, yeah, so I guess I've had those sort of experiences. And I guess, you know, you speak to anyone who's in palliative care and or even in cancer care as well, we've all got a, I guess, not only a professional but a personal degree of acquaintance with death and dying. And, yeah. um, and for some people it's like, okay, yep, I don't want to say that again. I don't want to touch that again. That's too scary or whatever else. Whereas I think for me I was like going, but I'm kind of intrigued by this. This is such a rich and privileged time to sit with people at their bedside yeah. and talk to them because it's completely stripped of frog shit. Yes. It's wonderful. If you sit with someone who's at their deathbed and they tell you their story and reflect on their life and you go, oh my God, this is like what a privileged position yeah. to sit here and, and to hear their advice. I was going to say, what are some of the lessons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's some brilliant ones, um, <laughs> surprising ones too. But I think, you know, the, the idea of uh, people tend to regret what they didn't do more than what they did do. And, again, mm. this is just sort of anecdotal from, from those sorts of, you know, those, those, you know, I've seen so many situations where people kind of had, you know, worked hard all their life, sacrificed, thinking that they would be rewarded with this great retirement only to be rewarded with the, 
diagnosis. So sold the yeah. caravan, couldn't get the refund on the big trip planned. And, and um, so they're going, do it now. I don't know how many people I had look at me in the eye and say, do it now. Wow. Um, I've had some people you know, say to me, go to Japan, go to this place in Japan, do, make sure you do this, make sure you do it. You know, just so, you know, um, desperately going, please just live. And, and yeah. their eyes just, um, just desperate to sort of have those, those experiences. Uh, just even if you can, you know, sit with somebody and give them a life review yes, and just go, tell me about your life, tell me about what you did and that kind of thing. Um, and I've heard the funniest stories. I've had times where we've been in tears of laughter. Oh my God. Pouring out of it. Um, and, and just such incredible moments as well. And like, I, I, Oh, I obviously don't want to lay the point because obviously we're so good to talk about psychedelics. But no. I remember one woman who, and I think this was the biggest lesson for me, and I will never forget this woman, um, who had a very strong family history of cancer in her background. So knowing this from the outset became, you know, vegetarian, didn't drink alcohol, didn't do any drugs, just lived this absolutely puritanical life of restriction and got a completely different cancer anyway. Oh my God. Wow. Young. Yeah. And I remember we had this beautiful woman who, who I love, she used to work at the, um, the hospice and she was one of our personal care attendants. She, she was a tea lady. She'd come in and she had this beautiful, you know, array and this thick accent. Anyway, we're having this sort of heart to heart discussion. And this woman is only maybe weeks from death cancers through her body. And again, as I say, she's young, she's quite a young woman. Um, Anyway, we hear this knock, 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 and, and the woman comes in and goes, darling, you want a cup of tea? You know, and he said, yeah. She said, you want chocolate cake? And she stopped and she looked at me and she said, you know, I've never had chocolate cake in my life. Oh. And I went, what? that was a really what? good time. That was a really good time to start. And so our beautiful tea lady cut, cut, cut this enormous chunk, huge chunk. Oh. You know, someone oh. who's never had sugar, who hadn't had all these things, and then had it. Now, I don't know if anyone's had this experience, but I saw someone have a chocolate cake for the first time in their Amazing. life. And her eyes, it was like a body gasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's unbelievable. It was. I was like, going, have you ever had? and she was just going, oh, my God. Like, and yeah. then, but the sad bit was then after that, and she said, why did I wait so long? Mm. And it wasn't just the, the chocolate cake. It was everything. Mm. Um, she'd put off life, put off life to try and stay safe. It got her anyway. Mm. So that was, for me, is the biggest the biggest learning. Um, yeah, that's I, amazing. Well, I mean, life ultimately gets us all anyway, you know, so we have to figure out this kind of path, do it anyway. you know? Yeah. 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 And it's a, it's a great question. Sorry to bunny, but it, it really is a great, uh, you know, testament to trying to find that balance between living a life of purpose and, and finding a sense of meaning that, 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 that uh, springs you forward day by day, but also, make sure, making sure that you smell the rose and you eat the chocolate cake and you do all that as well, you know? So that's amazing. Those moments. So yeah, they, they teach me so much. I mean, yeah. People go, Oh, you know, it's amazing what you do. And thank you for doing It's like, Oh my God, you have no idea what they teach me. I yeah. get so much. And that there's a currency you can't sort of place on no. the meaning in that way. So I'm, I'm extraordinarily privileged to do the work that I do. And, um, yeah, and it's just such a surprising, you never know what you're going to get you know, mm. every day, you know, the, and the stories, as I say, have just been, you know, phenomenal. Mm. phenomenal. So that's amazing. I, that, that's I love awesome. what we do. <laughs> yeah. so, I'm like, why wouldn't people want to work in palliative care? Yeah. Like, we can, like, we can like, I do work in palliative care. That must be so depressing. <laughs> I'm like, you've no idea. No, it's, it's lovely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you are getting the greatest teachers because they're standing upon the, the precipice of the, you know, the next life, so to speak. And they're looking over and they're kind of giving you, Hey, you know, this, this is what's good, what it's going to be like, you know, make sure you do this and do this. And has it kind of altered you in any way? Is, is there any um, specific piece of advice or something that's resonated actually changed the course of your life? Like I'm wondering if uh, some of that advice unconsciously, uh, you know, I suppose encourage you to jump into this uh, psychedelic clinical work or, or something. Yeah. Well, I would say in some way, yes. I, I, I guess I have to address the whole because people go, oh, you'd be so rounded and, you know, you don't sweat the small. Of course I sweat the small stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm like everyone else. But I guess that at the same time, um, like I'm still not looking forward to dying. Yes. Um, I'm gonna say, <laughs> Fair enough. But I don't think I'm afraid of living, if that cool. makes sense. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, So in that way, you know, when I was kind of warned by a couple of well-intentioned folk to not go down the psychedelic research road because it could be, you know, God, you know, just you're going to top your career there. That's just a career killer. What are you doing? Um, And, well, I was like, well, I mean, you, you, you see these people who are dying in bed and, um, and they are doubly incontinent and they may have been this. And what does it matter? If, exactly. I, if people exactly. think I'm a kooky psychologist who's doing this and if it brings them some, some peace and if they can transcend their suffering of an existential nature, then, mm. then absolutely let's do this, you know. Call me mm-hmm. kooky. Call me what you like. Absolutely. And the, <laughs> so, when you're on deathbed, you won't care. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like Aldous Huxley who yeah. who ordered 100 mics of acid on his deathbed. And you have this little scrawled note to his wife, and um, and died un, under the influence of acid. So you know, so cool. At their time, why should they not have access to something that could potentially help them? That that's Are definitely you- how I'm going out <laughs> with my favorite. Favorite author of all time. I'm obsessed with Aldous Huxley. And he's, I'm definitely keen to do the same thing as well. Yeah. <laughs> or a piece of chocolate cake. I think you've swayed me a little bit. Both, both. <laughs> yes. Oh, imagine that. That's unbelievable. Yeah. But you're totally right about, you know, these ideas that we just get lost in. You know, we start these, these truisms that are really just ideological matrices, you know, the, the, the matrix of, oh, you know, it's going to kill my career or the most important thing for me now is, you know, doing this or doing that. And then, you know, the idea of death, that's what's so wonderful about it is, you know, if you really meditate on that idea of death or if you're actually on your deathbed, it just blows everything out of the water. You just see it. You're you're at the top of the mountain. You're looking down on all the little different yous and you're like, why was I doing that? Why did I care so much about that? You know, when she dumped me, I was like that, you know, that got me for like three months, but like, why? (laughs) And you, you, you do, it kind of really strips it back to what's important. And, yes. and so there's a massive focus on priorities and, and what's important to me now, you know, um, what, what's, you know, what goals do I have now? What matters most to me at this moment? Um, and there's a lot of meaning making and legacy work and all that kind of thing that people can do. And, um, but everyone approaches death differently. Mm. So, you know, and look, I was, they're a very privileged position when I can work with people who are ready and they have faced uh, their mortality and to watch them, to, to, to watch them kind of navigate that and how they orient themselves to death is amazing to watch that. Um, I think for me, it was about how can I help the ones who aren't able yes. to do this, who are not ready, who are terrified and um, uh, just really anguished by the, the concept of having to, to say goodbye to everybody, um, you know, and in particular, yeah. depending on when illness strikes you, because if you've got little ones that you're leaving behind yeah, or even you feel ripped off, I mean, there's so many layers to it, but, um, and I went, you know, we need something to, to help access because it can just, it's so difficult to access that really visceral terror yep. of anxiety, death anxiety in particular, which mm. is, you know, arguably the root of all anxiety. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> so I think the, the the only, well, not the only thing, but but I think the only thing outside of a, of a fairly intensive type of spiritual practice like meditation or breath work or, or uh, you know, really intense sort of yogic regular spiritual practice, you know, psychedelics is the only other thing that I've ever seen come close to accessing that. Mm. It's, it, and it happens in a way that I don't think anything really else in psychiatry can. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm biased as a listener, know, but I do tend to agree because I think, you know, that, that idea of death anxiety, the death of the self, you know, mm-hmm. prior to having really looked into that abyss, you know, it, it's very much, well, I'm going to die. But before answering that question, these, these kind of transcendental practices, psychedelics, breath work, as you mentioned, they really help you uh, decipher the, your own definition of I and, and the who and, you know, and what all that is, you know, those very deep ideas, you know. Yeah. So when, when we really start to look in there, you know, like who am I, what am I, what is actually dying? I know that's kind of like an esoteric idea, I suppose, but when I die, like what is dying, you know, who, you know, it's so, uh, who is it that so dies? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So 
these these are big things. I'm actually just wondering. Um, I know I'm I'm really harping on this this idea of palliative care and death, but I think it's a really good precursor before we get into. That's my hustle. You go for it. Like I, it's, it's it's refreshing to have someone who wants to talk about death. Yeah. Um, so I can talk about it all day. That's yes. You know, yes. You're not making me uncomfortable at all. I don't know about no. you. <laughs> no, sure. Look, you know, one of the things, one of the best things that um, my mum did when when I was growing up was she was she was always happy to talk to me about death. She never sugarcoated it. And, you know, it was, um, I, I was really frustrated in the beginning when I first learned that I was going to die. So I was like, what, this is so cool though. Like, how does that make any sense? You know, I've just become a person, but then conversations <laughs> and learning more about, you know, it's, I believe it's probably the most important topic to consider because it adds, you know, the perfect contrast is okay. How to live life knowing that that's actually going to happen. But I was wondering how your clinical approach changes to dealing with people that are, are on their deathbeds. Because I've got a, a counseling background, but I, I can imagine that dealing with terminally ill patients, you're not just kind of going off run of the mill anxiety and, and grief training. There's a, there's a, it's a different ball game. Is that true? Yeah, to a certain extent. I, I also just want to say how, how wonderful is it that your mum gave you that. I know. Talk? Oh, she's great. I, I love it a bit. This is this is what we want, and I, I, I guess hoping that that you know coming from that kind of upbringing where you couldn't talk about it, and it was sort of, you know, oh gosh, yeah, don't don't talk about that. Kids don't go to funerals. Yes, don't talk about it. Even what kids don't know, they make up in their minds, and it can be very scary for them. But so to have as a, as a little one, even though that was confronting for you, yes, to um, go, damn, I just got here and I, I just made sense of it, and now I've got to go one day. You talk, I know. So, but to be able to talk freely about that is a wonderful gift your mum gave you, and I really hope that that is something that we offer our next generations to come. Totally. And not sugarcoating it either. It's like, oh, you know, we're going to die, but don't worry, there's heaven and, you know, you'll be fine. You know, it's like we, we want to be yeah. real. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that is that is a gift. That is a real a massive, you know, because then it does it does shape you, mm. you know, and, and how you kind of leave. So, this is a slight segue because I know you, I've got your, your questions are sitting there, but That's fine. There's, a, there's a really lovely um, – Oh, I can't. It might be. I'm going to say Pema Chodron, but I don't know that it was. But someone talked about this idea about death living on your right shoulder, mm. as I just saw to my left, <laughs> 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 just out of your right. just out of your, your your line of vision. But it just sits there. And but how important it is to kind of bring it forward so that you live anyway, and mm. knowing that that's coming. Mm. Um. So that's probably how it's impacted me personally from doing mm. that work. But to go back to your question and um, about how it, it is a little different, there's a there's a wonderful writer, Kenneth Docker, who talks about counselling individuals at the end of their life. And it does sort of move from, uh, you know, we, you know, in therapy, as you know, in your training, you know, you, you encounter resistance and you, okay, well, you sort of try and challenge that and um, you've got some some movement towards uh, what the future is going to look like and so forth. And I think when you, you move into someone who has a terminal illness and time is short, um, I guess rather than um, challenging mm. resistance to the idea of death, we have to develop a very different relationship to it. Because as, as Irvin Yolong says, it's kind of like staring at the sun, looking at death or facing one's mortality. And we tend to move in and out of a win, you know, confrontation with our mortality it can be too hard to look at it too much. We have to look away. Mm. Um, the goal being that we can actually look at it and sustain our our, our, uh, our gaze with it, but not with the sun, of course. <laughs> Don't concretize <laughs> it. <before. laughs> yeah. Analogy has but, uh, ceased, everyone. Analogy has ceased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, but I guess, you know, when we hit resistance, it's okay, you know, because the idea of, you know, annihilation of the self that's enormous. If mm. if we think, and I, when I do talks, you know, and I'm teaching or, or you know, with people who are moving into to palliative medicine, um, if you think about when you lose someone, that's that's hard enough. You losing that person, you're grief stricken. You think about what that's, that person will lose every single relationship they've ever known, existing, previous, so the, all the roles they've ever played in life. You know, all their experiences. You know, the smell of rain, which is raining right now. You yeah. know a good glass of wine, um, you know, 
the beach, the, you know, walking on sand, all of those beautiful, they're about to lose everything. That's enormous for our mm. psyche, hard to take. So we have to look away. So that's okay. So when we get that kind of resistance in this phase, therapeutically what you do with that is that that's okay. You respect it. That's okay. You can interview it. You can um, in some way engage with it. Um, it's not uncommon for me to speak with somebody who is, you know, they've been told they have, you know, stage four metastatic cancer and one day when they're ready to talk about it, that how, you know, what they're leaving behind, they may start reviewing their life a little bit and um, getting ready to say goodbye. Then the next time I could see them, they might be talking about third line chemo or signing up for a trial. Wow. And in a completely different headspace. Wow. So they have to really set the pace there. I don't know what I'm going to get every day. And and um and that's okay. I don't go in with a mandate and we don't force people's faces in it or anything like that. Yeah. We just yep. sort of we go with where they're at and, and and do talking around that. That's sort of affective denial. There is a difference that it's more of a pathological denial. For example, if somebody's got a curative type condition and they're so much in denial that they won't even, you know, access treatment right. and they've got this sort of tumor that's sort of growing and growing and growing and they're they're not even acknowledging it. That's a different, that's more pathologic. Yes. You may need to get in there if you can. But um, but the the affective denial, people will move in and out as as they do, as they confront death. And as I'm saying that, there's this booming thunder. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> just not raining here. It's just not raining here now. Sorry. It was. It's We're not too far from it. So, but um, yeah, sorry, it's just quite yeah it's like talking about death and yeah exactly <laughs> don't talk about death this is god <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh no talk more talk more um yeah. <laughs> so yeah it, it is a different one um but kenneth docker talks uh, very very explicitly about what it is and also tasks of the terminally ill they have to say goodbye hmm. they're letting go there's there's the unfinished business um and in some ways there's that was a, an interesting side effect that i think that we're starting to see emerge in the the psychedelic work, funnily enough, because um, people's reports, even in um, the, the Johns Hopkins work that they did in, in 2016 that they published, uh, there were, um, I think, uh, you know, a number of instances where patients had reported being able to deal with unresolved relationships, even if they had been with someone who was deceased, um, and which gave them a sense of peace and and forgiveness and you know it's some kind of reconciliation so that they could uh let go mm. uh which is an enormous gift Massive. i have to say the clinician seeing so many people quite uh tortured by unresolved relationship there's an enormous gift in that i think mm. so so i'm i'm very keen to see what what our work can offer people particularly in the terminal phase in that regard as well I mean, there's so much that that it can touch on, but but that one in particular is um, that's a big one for a terminal ill. So that that's such a, a really good point. I never actually thought of it like that. That so much a uh, you know so much of the suffering associated with with dying is because people feel like they still have things that need to be done, and you know they almost can't accept it yet because they have these. <laughs> you know, people that need to reconcile issues with and the, the work that was so meaningful for them and acceptance, like, how can I accept this knowing that there's still a place for me here? That's, I never thought of it like that. That would be really tough. Yeah. And it, it, you, you're spot on. Um, and I think you actually articulated it better than I did in that way because you're right. It's a, it's a not being able to say goodbye to my work. So say goodbye to my, you know, I, I've got to work at these relationships. Mm, I can't mm. go yet, or I can't let this go, or I've I've got work to do, or I've got a mission that I'm, mm. you know, and, yeah, we've got a mission. You know, thing where, where we've had people, you know, uh, bringing work in from the office. It's like, <laughs> wow, what are you doing? Uh, you know, but but they're desperate to make sure, you know. So you know, partners at the law firm have come in, going, "You sure you want to do this?" And you know, putting wow. <laughs> on the desk, and they go, "No, I have to." And it's so important to them. So they, you know, um, but then, uh, you know, to see reunion, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. You know, it, it's it's a wonderful thing to, to sort of see, you know, when people haven't been so well acquainted and then they, they can. Mind you in saying that there is um, <laughs> people die the way they live and we have had a, um, a situation whereby 
uh, a gentleman had unfinished business and brought all his family in to say goodbye and he'd been estranged from for about 20 years. And so our pastoral care team and, and you know, myself, we were sort of working together trying to get this, these family members and they came in and they're crying and it's go for ages. And then he lined them up and basically said, you can get fucked. No you way. Can go fucked. <laughs> and we were just like oh going, my God. oh, my oh. God. And then I was like, what have we done? What have we done? Yeah. But, but for him, that was it. And then he died three yeah, days later. That was it. <laughs> sort of way that he had to that was his you know and we don't know what happened there were there was lots of reasons that mm-hmm. he had for, for this estrangement but um yeah it can it can manifest in lots of weird and wonderful ways thankfully that's not usual yes yes <laughs> i guess to show you it's not always hand holdy and huggy and, and yes of course and it can be kind of sometimes a bit fractured and a bit prickly so um yeah, wow. yeah. <laughs> That's I know. What a way to go. <laughs> I know. He just lined them all up and went, right, you can make yeah. it. was worse. I mean, I was, I've, I've pretty, I've diluted the language. It was, it was live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, it was hysterical, but um, <laughs> not hysterical, but it was like, oh, my God. It was so, unique. <laughs> he, he said what he had to say. Yeah. Um, anyway, I digress. But the, I guess something about that hold of the, the, the unresolved you know, an unfinished business mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that is this really pleasing side effect that's that has sometimes been reported in in um, the previous studies with with patients. There's a documentary called Towards a New Understanding, and it's um it interviews uh, Bill Richards, who I'm more than you know ecstatic to say is one of my mentors and mm-hmm. you know, very dear to me. Uh, his son Brian, who also is, I think, in the, the documentary, and is also a mentor and friend of mine, um, and they they talk about their experiences, you know, working with patients who have cancer and and um, with psilocybin, and they interview some of the patients' uh, experiences. And, and there's one gentleman who talks about this ability to be able to kind of transcend some of these these fractured relationships in his life, and how that was something that was really profound for him. Mm. So I think that uh, on, on that level, and given that the, the time limit. I guess they're sort of bounded by this very limited time. It's very, um, very appealing for for our our area. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, so often we you know we think about reconciliation as a need to, you know, say this to someone or, or do this to show that you know things have been resolved. But it's it's often the the shame that we're carrying within ourselves or the guilt that you know it, it's it's reconciling the the, the holes and the gaps within ourselves, and that's what's so interesting. And we can now actually finally, um, you know, document this kind of stuff scientifically, you know, this is all happening with you here. I know the person that you want to have this conversation or confrontation with is thousands of kilometers away, but take this bit of psilocybin and you have these experiences and it's just, wow, I can't believe I was holding on to that. Or I thought it was this. And, you know, sometimes it is, um, you know, making those connections and, and, and having those reconciliations, but oftentimes it can also be just, um, accepting, the shame that we've been unconsciously carrying ourselves. Absolutely. And develop a new relationship to that. Yes. Um, which is wonderful. Um, so in, in that way, you know, there's, there's so many mechanisms of therapeutic um, gain for, for our, for our patients in that way. And they can, mm. they can develop a new relationship to whatever they were carrying with that relationship that may not be able to be resolved for whatever reason they're dead or they're probably not amenable to that sort of a chat or because we've obstructed it because of our own shame and guilt, as you say. So I think that there's there's definitely that, but we can develop a new relationship to our illness, to the concept of death, which is the core of it, um, and have almost a bit of a dry run, um, yeah. facing it, I feel like, um, and it can you know, as you know, occasion really quite profound mystical experiences, spiritual experiences that we we still really are just beginning to understand. Mm. Um, we've got more neuroscience than ever and we're, we're getting better at understanding what's going on in the brain and we know the pharmacokinetics and we know it's tryptamine and it can, you know, it's serotonergic and it can do all these wonderful things for our mood and default mode network. And, but, but there's that really kind of profound and enriching experience that, that um, we're still really trying to understand because that's the thing that makes it um, able to access mm. that really guttural, and visceral um, fear um, 
or, or despair. So, yeah, we're I, I'm I feel extraordinarily privileged to work with you know psilocybin um, in this therapeutic context. Mm. Yeah. So what what drew you to psilocybin specifically? Because people are doing work with DMT and ayahuasca and MDMA, and what what was it about psilocybin for you? Um. Well, funnily enough, I had actually been considering using MDMA for end of life anxiety because I thought it would sort of you know in in um, a therapeutic mechanism would sort of be able to restore a sense of safety of the body in much the same way that, you know, before you process trauma in, in PTSD. Um, but I, it sort of had, unfortunately, from a neurotoxic point of view, it was a little bit more risky for our uh, patients, although um, I'm speaking with colleagues in New Zealand who are about to embark on something pretty exciting, hopefully, um, uh, in end-of-life care. So that would be mm. amazing if they can get that up. And Charlie mm-hmm. Grob actually wanted to do that originally, but I think um, it had a bit of a, a stain on its uh, name, if you like, as being obviously party job. Yeah. And at that stage they felt that MDMA would be harder to get FDA approval for. Okay, so right. they went with psilocybin and at a lower, lower dose. Um, psilocybin's probably got a number of benefits clinically um, as opposed to well, I guess let's start with ayahuasca, which is, you know, you start with getting protein spit, so you have to kind of Big vomit and yourself <laughs> inside out. And so we're, they're already pretty sick, so we don't want to do the um, <laughs> DMT, you know, it's a shorter shorter duration. We didn't know so much about it at that point. Um, psilocybin, preferable to LSD because that's an 8 to 12-hour window of, you know, um, drug effect compared to four to six hours. Yeah. So it made sense we could do things, you know, in a in a, an outpatient a day procedure if you like. We didn't have to keep people overnight and um mm. you know, and mm. it can be an exhausting experience anyway, but it can be an exhausting experience for someone who's terminally ill, so who already has the burden of mm. medical condition um, <clears throat> and frailty, uh as well as a whole host of medications on board. So we had to kind of have a think about what was going to work best and obviously that the evidence was pointing towards psilocybin anyway so i guess we wanted to really continue on the work that had been done with with um johns hopkins and nyu and ucla charlie grob who um yeah he's one of our international collaborators and a a wonderful wonderful man so Mm. yeah very very lucky we've had a lot of great support by the gurus so that's been lovely. yeah well it's just so important you know it, it's so important that, you know this is this is you know beyond working with terminally ill patients you know we're up we're, we're kind of opening the door on some of the biggest questions that human beings have been asking since the dawn of humanity you know like who am i what happens when we die you've kind of got two in one there almost you know yeah. so the only other one that's bigger is uh, are we alone in the universe i suppose so and sometimes people have reported uh, answers to those questions on psychedelics as well. So you're doing probably the most important work anyone could be doing without uh, getting, you know, <laughs> losing too much. <laughs> it's big stuff. Well, yeah, I, I again, just the, the privilege of, of being able to sit with these beautiful people at the end of their life, which is such a mm. rich time, actually, really rich and full of meaning. And um, But then to, to be able to offer them an experience like this and, um, you know, I mean, and again, COVID sort of stopped us in our tracks but when we we just started last year and then we had to put the brakes on because of the COVID directives and it was no longer safe to to, to run it in the hospital at that stage. So we're about to recommence next week. Hooray. Oh, good, amazing. Um, but, but before that, you know, uh, one of the I, – I have a, a dear friend who is a social worker um, at, at our palliative medicine ward um, very seasoned social worker, amazing human, and had um, and she does qualitative interviews for our study after people have had their experiences before and after um, at each of their doses, and, and had this incredible interview with one of our um, our participants. Walked out of the room and looked at me and just burst into tears. Mm. So you know, and she just um, yeah, that's just. I was, you know, just talking about somebody who's got, you know, nearly 30 years experience as a social worker. And yep. Just couldn't believe it. Blown. So, yep. um, yeah, we're, we're dealing with something pretty special, I guess, is what, what I'm getting at. And we, we know how special this is. And um, so I hope um, we can continue the, the incredible work that's going on in the US and 
UK, Israel, Europe. I mean, it's just getting so much traction. We're, we're quite behind here. So mm. um, yeah, Israel, yeah. yeah. They're doing some work with MDMA and PTSD and stuff as well. There's a great right. documentary, Trip of Compassion. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That was great. Um, yeah, and I think, um, you know, I had, uh, you know, they're, they're on the cusp of something very exciting. I think the, um, I had, a, I'm, I chatted with, with Rick Doblin on, I reckon it would have been June last year, maybe sort of mid last year. And they were just in the, the throes of getting their, their studies all had to cease as well because of COVID. And he had just done his interim analyses and showed me on the screen when we were Skyping and my jaw just dropped. I was like, you're shaking. And now I, I mean, the effect size was something like nearly 90%. It was 89%, 89 percent, 89 point. And you just go, what? So, um, I wouldn't be surprised if MDMA for PTSD will be a an approved medicine. Mm. I would say by 2022. Oh, that's amazing! Yeah, I've got to take that right? from the podcast and so <laughs> out in the social. That's <laughs> awesome. We won't say not for, to do it, but that I, is. I'm not saying for sure, but but I think no. that if they stay on track and they're able to do that, um, I I I you know, I imagine it would be an approved medicine mm. in 2022. That's, that's amazing. Saying. Yeah, they've just done incredible work and mm. they've got, you know, a lot of data now, a yes. lot of good soft data. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the MDMA will, will obviously be first, I think, and then psilocybin oh. some down the track. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So MDMA first before psilocybin. That's really interesting. That's cool. Well, only because I think of where they're at in terms of their clinical trial. Right. Phase. So they're at phase, they're, they're completing their phase three. Oh, yes, phase so three. Basically, when you do clinical trials, it sort of, you know, starts at, you know, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase three is when you do lots and lots and lots of people. So it's the, it's kind of where you pressure test uh, your medications. Mm. And, um, it, you know, if you've ever seen a little pamphlet in those boxes of, you know, antibiotics or whatever that you, your medication you've got, and it says these are your side effects, and this is commonly happened to ten percent. Blah, blah blah blah. This phase three kind of data will, will inform that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, so you know your side effects. You know, it's not should, you know it shouldn't be taken with this, or you know, it's not good yep. for people under whatever age. So you know, we, you get you get some of that data there. So I'd say it will move pretty quickly. Wow. Um, once they wrap their studies up. Wow, that, that's a, that's amazing. Um. So, yeah, so, Mark, if you could take us through kind of like a, a, a trial what and what actually happens there. So my understanding is um, there's this whilst the psilocybin is being administered, you're also um, taking the patient through a therapeutic process. Is that right? That's sort of more with MDMA for okay. PTSD. So they, they do differ slightly, the, the, the treatment protocols. The, the one thing that, that with, PT, you know, um, MDMA for PTSD, uh, and again, I'm speaking as not as a registered MAPS therapist, sure, sure. certainly having an understanding of how that would work. But the the idea being MDMA kind of, you know, um, the drug effect, you know, providing a sense of safety in the body, um, where the, the therapist then, you know, cue and, and work through trauma mm. quite a right? so there's a conversational uh um and therapeutic working through in that session. Um you know, looking at different parts of self, uh, you know, kind of like internal family systems kind of mm. model um, with some, you know, mindfulness kind of sensory motor psychotherapy kind of sort of stuff as well, um, but largely from internal family systems theory. Um, so that's much more active in, in those dose sessions. Psilocybin, much more hands-off, much mm, more. Hands-off. Interesting. We, we need to get kind of get out of the way of the, the process that's happening for, for that person. Um so mm. because I guess of the, the nature of being a psychedelic, a classic psychedelic, visually, um, um, viscerally, there's a lot more kind of yeah. going on and unfolding. Um, and really it's kind of getting out of the way so that the wisdom of their own psyche, if you like, you know, because it, it that and I've always said this is the poetry of psychedelics, and particularly psilocybin. I think is that it really can evoke one's own genius. Yeah, in, they can access expanded, deepened perspective um, and states that are obviously um, uh, not not as attainable in ordinary waking conscious states. Um, so I think that where there is kind of benevolent support crew, <laughs> yeah. if you like. Um, and, and the work is really in the preparation and the integration afterwards. So um, as, as therapists, in saying that, if they hit rocky terrain and, and 
reach out to us, we absolutely help them move um, into their discomfort. It's just sort of that radical act of moving, yeah. you know, forward and in, and in, you know, and like uh, I love how, how Bill Richard says, if you, you see, you know, a dragon or a gaga or you look it in the eye, you dive into its mouth. <laughs> um, absolutely. And because it can transform into something quite um, profound. Um, yeah. If you meet it in that way, if you start panicking and, and you want to, you know, hit the, hit the get get me out of here kind of button, you're almost guaranteed a panic attack then. So it's really very much about uh, being, I guess, there at the ready if they need, mm. but allowing them to, to navigate their process. Mm, mm. Um, yeah. That's awesome. It, it's just, it's so, it's so interesting hearing, hearing this stuff, you know, I uh, fell in love with Carl Jung, as I'm sure you can understand uh, after a major psychedelic episode where I was really trying to integrate and understand, you know, so it's a, such a cliche, yeah. such a cliche. Oh, no, it's, but, but it's incredible. I mean, the archetypes and symbol, the, yeah. the symbolism is so rich and, you know, Jung is a, is a, a big favorite of about mm. many people that, that I speak with. And, and it's a wonderful way of understanding psychedelic spirits too. And yeah. Um, archetypes and, yeah, it's it's amazing because Jung, uh, as far as I can tell, never actually uh, had an, a psychedelic experience. He was just going up upstairs after dinner, I think it was, and just accessing the unconscious inverted commas um, through through intense meditations. You know, and he was um, um, trying to work through his own dreams and, and things like this. And dreams are incredible experiences as well that are very very similar to psychedelic experiences if you can remember them. You know, and he almost. Yeah provided a, a blueprint um, and a model for the psyche, which, you know, using mythology and, and these things that we, we thought were just primitive stories, you know, but they're actually coming from this very deep kind of unconscious place. If, if you know, if, if you go into all that kind of stuff, but you kind of can't help if you have these experiences like, Oh, that's really, I remember reading about that in a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, Oh, hang on. Now I kind of, yeah. So there's, there's a, you can approach things with new eyes. I think, I think Jung though is, is, um, uh, there's 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 something about the the way that he accessed his his own mm. intent, um, through the intense meditation. So he he achieved an altered state of consciousness of, um, you know, sufficient depths that he was able to kind of really, and quite um, um, I'm trying to find the word. Sorry, it's my holiday brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Sorry, first the, day, the first day back. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, but the way he encapsulated it was just, I mean, it's brought so much to to psychology just in mm. general. Mm. Um, and not only psychology, mythology, anthropology, you know, I, this, um, the arts. So yeah. I think uh, he hit something really deep. Um, yeah. yeah, he did. It was amazing. And, you know, so many practical guides, you know, uh, where your fear is, there your task yeah. is, you know, what, 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 what you used to do as a child that made time fly or hours fly seconds, that's there and lies the, the pursuit of your life or whatever it is, you know, all these ideas are so, so wonderful. But so, so when, when you're administering the, the, the psychedelic, how is it a, is it, does the dose depend upon the, the, the patient? Um, or is it a, is it, if it's because it's a trial to a same dose for everyone or how, how does that look? So the, the previous studies did look at having, um, I think it was what, point whatever milligrams per kilo of body weight. Okay. Um, I found that, that wasn't particularly, it was sort of six, one, half dozen, the other. Um, so they now have a standard dose um, uh, for the number of studies that I've been made aware of, particularly, I know that there, they are still, some uh, studies are still doing that, but for the most part. So we're in partnership and collaboration with USONA. Um, who I have got to say have just been incredible and in providing our psilocybin to us for free. Mm, wow, awesome. So, oh, oh, that's are, amazing. I know. <laughs> Your listeners will jump onto that one, I think, Mark. <laughs> Not everyone. Uh, yeah. If you're doing a political job, because um, you just want to have a go. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, so they just decided what they were going to do with a stat dose, 25 milligram. Okay. Um, which is probably roughly equivalent to for your listeners who are interested. Um, I think about four milligrams dried cubensis, mm. um, and less of I think psilocybin, the, the sub rugged, which I can never pronounce. I know, yeah, psilocybin. Yeah. Oh, I know. There's an Australian psilocybin mushroom. 
And um, if Kane Barlow was listening to this, he was one of our local mycologists. Yeah, it's so it's screaming like, oh, at the TV. <laughs> um, oh, God, I can't pronounce this. Teach me, Kane. Um, but yeah, so that, that one's sort of a, obviously is a stronger sort of a strength, but it's sort of around about five grams dried cubensis. So it's okay. it's a decent dose. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely um, hallucinatory. And yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, and again, um, that that was that was kind of decided upon as being the sort of the sweet spot mm-hmm. for for, for uh, some of the trials that, that you know depression and certainly for ours. Um, so yeah, not underwhelming, not overwhelming. Um, the higher the dose, you're more likely to get anxiety. We know that. Um, so, uh, but also the higher do- the dose, you know, you can kind of more likely to get a mystical, mystical type experience as well. So there's we're still just trying to find that sweet spot, and that seemed to be it. There are studies looking at forms of addiction over in the US. Um, I think one's looking at cocaine addiction, um, um, alcohol addiction, and they do have higher doses because, okay. the, um, yeah, just because of desensitization of receptors. Oh, yes. So um, they've had to sort of titrate up doses for, for the various populations mm, because there is there is a psilocybin does have an effect on the dopaminergic system as well as the serotonergic system doesn't it so people are addicted yeah, to the, cocaine or whatever that the receptors would be desensitized as you say and yeah a little and um, so i think um what they were sort of i think mindful of is that they would have this experience that just wasn't <laughs> touching the sides in, in yeah. some way so it wasn't enough to sort of promote therapeutic change um so yeah i mean It'll be interesting to see how how um, the, the studies uh, inform how treatment's going to be, mm. uh, uh, I guess, managed. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping, hoping we can continue to have good results and and safe results, and and present that to the, the FDA, and then TGA kind of listen to the FDA. So then, what they kind of says is okay. It, it tends to happen here as well. So yeah, yeah. And and. <laughs> What are some of the results that you're seeing? Some of the studies that, that are coming back with this data, um, some of the overwhelming, you know, evidence in support of this kind of thing. Is it, was it maybe maybe you could talk about one or two studies, perhaps that really kind of blew your mind? Uh, look, well, I guess I keep going back to my own <laughs> sort of era. Yeah. Like the, the John Hopkins, the the so Roland Griffiths and and um, Matt Johnson and you know, Bill Richards, Byron Richards, who, the, the crew who were working at Johns Hopkins doing the cancer studies was just phenomenal. They, I think they took through around 59, maybe 50, no, sorry, 51 participants. Um, and just the the fact that they could achieve such rapid, dramatic improvement in depressive symptomatology, anxiety symptomatology, and then have this maintained six-month follow-up, mm. you know, after... Well, they did a high and a low dose sort of a uh, two-dose session kind of a situation, but the, the dose was that low. It was sort of fairly negligible. In saying that, you know, microdosing and so forth is probably going sh- to show us that that has some sort of therapeutic effect as well. And um, and NYU, who were doing a, what we're doing, which is similar, so they used um, psilocybin versus a placebo called niacin. Um, mm. uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, which gives you a big flushing response. So if you're psychedelic naive and you have this big oh, flushing experience, and they go, hang on, have I got the root? Um, so our first dose session is you can either get the active psilocybin or you may get the active niacin. So you'll get a dose of vitamin if nothing else. <laughs> um, but then, and we run the session just as we would if you were having psilocybin, but then several weeks later we, we follow people up. And then we offer everyone an open label dose of psilocybin. So that means the second dose, everyone gets psilocybin. Right. Because that way, the, the tricky thing is when you run a clinical trial, it, it, you have to demonstrate because the placebo effect is so strong, as you mm-hmm. would understand, um, you have to, the gold standard is to do a randomized controlled trial that's blinded so that the participant doesn't know what they're getting. And also the people who are missing it doesn't, don't, they don't know what. Wow. So it's double blind. Matter. So it's double blinded. So wow. we don't know either. So we oh, pick it up and we're like sitting there watching the participant going, do you think they've got it? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Idea, um, on the dose day where it's a randomised control. So the first dose is a randomised control dose. Okay. And that, then we follow people up for seven seven weeks and that then indicates and we can show the FDA and TGA. Um, okay, so 
they got, you know, once it's all unblinded, okay, placebo, or da, da, da. so we can show effects after seven weeks. Mm. Um, and that's the, the way that you demonstrate if, you know, uh, medicine is efficacious. Um, yes. And it's not just placebo. And so, yeah, but then because we didn't feel right about people not having that experience of, you know, psilocybin, you know, they're, they're terrified and then suffering and like, oh, sorry, you got the nice and see you later, thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't feel right about that, so we, we put an an open label extension phase mm. um, on top of that. So then everyone had the opportunity to have um, the the full treatment, and even if they had it the first time, they can still have it the second time. And now we can sort of determine whether one or two doses is more effective. Yes. So so there's a, a little advantage to that as well. So yeah, mm. so we kind of borrowed that from from NYU. But I would have to say those were the two studies that really opened my because it was literally the next day after they've had the dose session, their, their depression and anxiety scores just plummeted to, to below clinical levels and they stayed that way. And then that six months later were, um, you know, that like they hit clinical, not only remission, but um, uh, I mean, it was re- resolution of, of um, yeah, it was, well, it was, it was, it was remission of depression and remission mm. of anxiety. It's so the closest thing to a magic pill, you know. It really you, you sort of just go, my God, you know. And for the people that didn't, and this is what what um, Roland's uh, Johns Hopkins study found that for the people that didn't respond, it was about twenty percent of people that just sort of were like, "Not for me." Mm. Um, and if they didn't particularly like the experience, or if it was aversive or whatever else, didn't go beyond the session. There was no kind of nasty side effects that, that trailed with them or anything. They just, yeah. You know, that was interesting or it wasn't for me. So I think that, but, you know, that's an enormous amount. You're know, talking about totally. 70 to 80% of the, the population across those studies that had a therapeutic effect of, you know, fairly pretty big statistical significance. Yeah, but also, to, I mean, to your point just there about a um, a risk analysis, you know, four out of five people are having an incredibly profound experience, experience excuse me, and of the people that aren't, you know, they're not, there's no like serious life threatening issues that, that become of them. It's just, it wasn't for them. So it's just positive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I guess one of the things and you know, it would be remiss of me to, to not say that there are risks with it. Of course. We'll to that at the moment. But I think one of the things that, that we've had to work hard to do in the, the Renaissance is kind of say, this isn't, you know, it's not, dangerous so people are mm. saying oh, it's dangerous it makes you jump off building i mean yeah you can do some stupid things when you're under the influence if you're in a situation where you're unsafe and it's mm. indiscriminate use um but it's not dangerous for the reasons that people had been told or, or the the that political propaganda had kind of pushed in their political backlash in uh, the nixon administration yeah um, and in fact the science was saying something very different to that but mm. but i think at the same time um well, they're, they're probably the, the reason that they're also getting very good results with the studies is that they have a very rigorous screening program. Mm. Um, and there are certain people that we know don't do well with psychedelics. If you have a history of psychosis, um, if you've got a history of, you know, bipolar um, disorder, that's particularly bipolar one where there's psychotic features as well, it can precipitate an episode or even yeah. relapse. So, um, we're very mindful of of that. So even though um, people are like, oh my god, you can move mushrooms. Well, yeah, actually, in order to get on the, the study, w- there's a lot of screening before yep. you get there. There's a lot of stuff that we have to just we have to make sure that you're safe enough to take this. Um, so and then and then the way that we prepare people and you know trying to sort of make sure that we've got a very good sense of who that human is. Um, and, you know, knowing how they can tolerate it or may not tolerate it or if they need a little bit more work um, before that and if they can kind of feel a sense of trust with us because it's such a vulnerable space, it's a mm. very vulnerable space in that way. So, yeah, we're, there's there's good reason to screen properly but I think if you do that, you're much more likely to have, um, you know, a, a beneficial outcome there so yeah yeah and i mean i think that's such an important consideration especially with schizophrenia and you know psychosis psychosis and all that sort of stuff and also just you know 
that, that's got, that doesn't necessarily have anything to say about the psychedelics themselves, just where we are in, 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 in terms of the science. We just don't know enough about yet. You know, 60 years, <laughs> it's not a very long time. We haven't been doing that for long, so. No, that's exactly right. And at this stage, that's what we yeah. know about it. Those are the parameters that we know. So we know that the, the factors contributing to adverse events are that if you do hold uh, even a family history, it can just sort of um, pose that risk to you. It may, it may not. Um, but we know that that if you do have a predisposition to that, you are more at risk of having an adverse mm. event. Um, but also, um, uh, I guess, if you know, you've had very, very complex trauma and, and has a, you have a character structure that's sort of um, uh, not as, not as, I guess, um, much solo, but, but if, it, if it's, if it's fragile, if people come and they're feeling quite fragile, there's a lot of work to be done around that. So yeah. DMA for PTSD would probably speak to that better. But um, we know that if it's not handled correctly in that way, people can be re-traumatised. So there yes. are risks. We don't want to say that there are none. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't work with that and certainly it doesn't mean that, that future work may not address that. But at the moment as it stands, um, I think that there are the known risks that, you know, for, particularly for psychosis and bipolar are the ones mm. that would be saying, yeah, that, that's the, yeah, those are the ones that they'll be saying not, not, not at this stage. Yes. No, I, I see. I think that's actually a really good point. And, you know, to, to kind of backpedal on my previous point about the whole magic pill thing, that's a classic uh, human idea that we want the thing that's going to fix us straight away. But, but so often that the integration is, is necessarily gradual and progressive. And, you know, to bring it back to Carl Jung, one of the things he said yes. was um, uh, be aware of wisdom that you haven't asked for. And if you, step too far into the, the unconscious or whatever it is without taking the time to cultivate a sense of self and, and, a, and a necessary protection against that. As you say, you can be re-traumatized or you can be blown out of the water and drown in, in, in those oceans. So I think that's a really good point to, you know, pe- people are like, oh, you know, the, the, the clinical approach is so outdated. So it's so, you know, it's so slow and, and uh, but like sometimes that is necessary, a slow kind of gradual um, exposure into some of the, the more troubling things. Yeah. And I think, and look, I completely understand where people's frustration come in with, you know, the clinical side of it being so slow. But, um, you know, I heard this really good presentation and I can't even remember who, sorry, the names are escaping me today. <laughs> this, <laughs> but just for, for the show, this is literally your second day back, isn't it? Like you have <laughs> yeah. very justified to be in holiday mode right now. No, and I'm so, yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, folks, I'm not sorry. Um, <laughs> Need some content. I remember at 3 a.m., but this guy I talked about in this, this context and he said, look, you know, after everything that's happened, after the backlash and everything, we've got one shot at this. Mm. And if we fuck it up, mm-hmm. um, sorry, G-rated, not more. Uh, this more podcast more. is not G-rated. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Um, but, yeah, but if we, if, we, if we screw this up, you know. Totally we could get the same backlash again. So I think, you know, particularly in the research world, we're very mindful of the responsibility that we hold. Mm. If things don't go well, um, we don't want to, we don't want to fuck this up. Yeah. And it may be this is a very fragile re-entry back into medicine, back into psyches. We want to provide good science because that's when, you know, minds open and change and, you know, and, and we can kind of create a new understanding. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, yes, it's slow. It's a, pain in the ass it's like, but we, we have to do this right yeah. um you know and we do we sort of hold that that responsibility with the you know you're like don't fuck it up don't fuck yes it up. you know it's so true good research um, totally totally it's a it's, a, it's something you know that people probably wouldn't be able to see the uh political analogy there but i, I would classify myself as a progressive conservative <laughs> i'm on the fence but it's like we need change we need to move forward but also recognize that change can also bring with it things that we, we we're not sure about. So that's such a good point that you raise. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, and there we're more likely to do it if we do it kind of slowly and, and in a, we're more likely to get kicked back if we just, just go. <laughs> Everyone yeah. has <laughs> Everyone check out mushrooms. Well, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, hey, you know, bring your own mushroom to work day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just bring some shiitake, I think. Exactly. And I think, 
you know, this is a problem. We only just need, we're one bad experience where somebody does something under the influence or, or what have you. It, it hits a headline and then all of a sudden we're back to square one. So there's, there's a lot of concern around that, I think, um, mm. uh, in lots of circles as well. And so we're, we're doing our best to kind of, yeah, get, get good science, understand how we can optimise this as best as we can for various conditions and just understand it a bit more as well. Mm. I mean, That's it's, a, um, mm. it's such a mysterious compound. I mean, the, you know, psilocybin as a medicine is fascinating, mm. absolutely fascinating. It's um, And I still don't really kind of understand fully mm. what it is we're actually doing here. Yeah. Yes, but... Yeah, we've got Make the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's some, you know, the mechanisms of action that, yes, we understand and we've got language for it from a neuroscience point of view and from a, you know, psychological, psychiatric, but there's just so much about this that still surprising mm. to us. And, and um, so that's the beauty of it. It just, it has me absolutely uh, um, bamboozled at times and I want to understand that. So mm. as a researcher, as a clinician, I'm like, I ain't trying to figure you out mm. um so but at the same time not lose the poetry of it i'm very mindful um and i've spoken about this before of, of holding a um you know a, a cultural responsibility here this is this is an ancient medicine that has been yeah. used for you know centuries so um build a modern medical protocol around that okay so we've, we've done that but uh, I, yeah i want to do it justice the worst that we're doing um, yeah I love, I really love that you said that. I think that's so brilliant because I think, um, yeah, that, I think that's so awesome that you said that because so often science can reduce uh, some of the poetry and the romance, you know, down to, oh, well, this is what's happening in the brain. But the experience itself is so profound that explaining it in those terms just does it almost harm, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and we lose the essence of that. We don't want to intellectualize it, dissect it to, to the point where it's just, you know, you don't want to lose the, the, the profundity and the something. There's something really sacred about those experiences for people. Mm. Um, things that that don't, you know, the words just don't do it justice. Mm. It's visceral. It's 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 guttural. It's it's um transcendental. Science has a hard time with that. Um, but yeah, I don't want to lose the poetry. We we lose the poetry of that. Then I've not done a good job of it mm. at all. Um, it's the reason why I wanted to ensure that we were doing interviews with people rather than just the, you know, we've got to do the whole gold standard checklist, you know, depression and venture and anxiety mm. venture, you know, do you feel this and how, you know, on a Leichhardt scale, but, but um, I, I wanted people to still be able to freestyle in their own words, talk about what that was like, you know, gosh, you know, you know, what insights, what was challenging, what did you go through that kind of thing so that they could kind of um, speak about, this without being constrained and, mm. and um, uh, because we lose so much richness in our chest. It's just mm. trying to squash and compress experiences, lived experiences into a tick box. Like, come on, are you kidding me? Mm. Um, and even though it, even words as an, an interview, it's, it's that's still kind of compressing it to, to a certain extent as well, but at least we give them a way of being able to speak to something. Yeah. Like, yeah, you, you can't conceptualize or and and I don't think you need to. You know, you can just live it, and that can be enough. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, you know, it's funny. One of the things that we say to people, and this is part of our preparation and integration with people, is that, and this is quite, um, you know, it's just part of the protocol that is repeated in a number of studies as well. And we talk about um, after they've had the experience they want to tell everyone <laughs> now yeah not necessarily a good idea <laughs> so we have to talk with them quite explicitly about being really judicious about who you speak to about your experience because mm -hmm. it may not be heard with receptive ears mm -hmm. or with an understanding and what what they run the risk of is telling people and then having their experience disregarded dismissed diminished in some way that really you know that that's that's something that's really sacred and and important to them yeah to sort of be be mindful of okay 
you know what, if you hadn't had this experience before and you've never had a psychedelic and someone told you all these experiences, how would you respond? Yeah, like, oh, true. Freaking weird or whatever. Yeah. Um, so you may want to share this with everyone and, you know, you may have this experience where you just, oh, God, it was so profound. I have to tell everyone about that. But we're, we're, we're just sort of thinking, have a little think about who you would choose to mm. trust. That's with, amazing. With, because um, the, the, we don't want them to have that experience of being completely rejected or, or mocked even. Um, Totally. Yeah. Cause they, they might deal in, uh, you know, very, very conservative circles necessarily, you know, just part of their job or yeah, that, that's such, that's such a good point, man. I'm learning so much on this fucking podcast. <laughs> awesome. um, but it's really great. There are so many things that we're talking about that, you know, because I come from a very four <laughs> on the side, but <laughs> the, some of the stuff you're talking about, the necessary protocol, the, the, the importance of the, the clinical side of things, the things you like, We've thought of so much to really make sure that this stuff can has every fighting chance of, of becoming legalized, I think is so powerful. And I think, you know, if someone just went out there and told everything, everyone about their experience, unfortunately their experience might serve as an overall reflection of who they are, which is, which can be quite harmful. So yeah, that's such a good point. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. We're, we're just, I think, you know, being, I guess, yeah, respectful of, of that person's process and, and helping yeah. them make sense of it, but also in a way that, that, that you know, because, oh gosh, you know, the, the number of people I've spoken to in, in various ways have sort of reached out to me from you know, psychedelic communities or what have you and, and talked about uh, how Western medicine doesn't really have a language or a framework for really properly understanding this, and I get that. Whereas if you go and have an experience, say, in an Indigenous country or South, South America, for example, um, th- there's a way of understanding psychedelic experience that makes perfect sense within that that cultural context, mm. the way they understand mm. plant medicine. You know, that, um, and they'll go, yeah, of course, that's what that plant will tell you. That's because plants talk, yeah, that's how, you know, they understand mm. plant medicines. We have a very different take on that here you know if, if we you know said to somebody okay well psilocybin will talk to you like this <laughs> it's a mushroom, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so so obviously you know we have to think about how this sort of experience enters our cultural psyche mm. Uh, mm. and how some people have trouble hearing it um when they don't have that experience or they don't understand it. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a necessary part of that. And I think that, you yeah. know, that's something that um, is, is really important um, in terms of the, the preparation and, and talking through and just having us, just having a, a special someone that you can talk with about it. The other thing that seems to be happening, and I think this is probably one of the areas that will move forward to in the future. And I would like to see more of this. If you're a group person in that way, um, they're now doing, psilocybin therapy in groups mm, mm. so people will have their own experience but then they'll come as a group and talk about it so you know it's much the way that you know integration circles are functioning right now um um the that you can really you know like i understand that you know the importance of of, of groups therapy groups therapy mm. can be amazing you know they using the, the dynamics in, in in the room but to also have someone who gets it yes yes and goes, yeah, yeah. So, so, so they're bonded by virtue of their symptoms, of whatever that's going on for them, whatever condition that is, um, but also by this incredible experience that they're trying to find words for. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and it was so arresting that it just was, wow, you know, um, to, to, just to have this sort of shared understanding of, wow, something pretty special just happened. Yeah. Talk with you openly about it and not feel like you're going to think I'm crazy or, oh, my God, that's just so weird and, Oh my God, you know, how hippie is that or whatever. I mean, this, um, so I think there's, there's merit in, in looking at that treatment modality as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a tried and true method. You know, the, the a very, exa- a very classic example is a first time mother's group where, you know, there are all these women are having these incredibly new experience. They have something growing in them or it's just come out, you know, and they're, and, you know, having a, a, a group full of people who understand where they feel comfortable enough to say things that perhaps aren't uh, socially acceptable, like, oh, don't you just hate it or don't you just wish you could have your life back or like oh, it's a weird thing. And, like, I'm, I'm pretty- <laughs> like that was, that was shit. Oh, God. And that's okay. You know, exactly, um, exactly. But to have people who get it. Is yes. So important. Um, 
eyes that look at them and go, okay, wow, amazing. That's just, yeah, tell me more about that or whatever it is and and not judgy or, you know, raised eyebrows and um, that's so important that, that people can hear this mm. experience. Sometimes you do have to get it, you know, you can, okay, listening, good listening can only go so far sometimes, I suppose. Well, I mean, yeah, and it, it, it doesn't, as we say, you know, when they're sort of choosing a support person to sort of speak to, they don't necessarily have had to have had that experience, mm. but at least know that they can hear it. They've got, you know, they understand that they're in the study. They understand that these are the kind of experiences and we touch base with them too. Um, this is, you know, they're usually the person that picks them up at the end of the study or at the end of the day. Um, and stays with them for, for 24 hours and mm. says, oh, try not to talk to them too much, give them some time to sort of do some processing and thinking and, and mm. just kind of marinating in, in uh, what they went through and we encourage people to journal. Yes. Um, and we actually give them a journal. So there's there's lots of, yeah, um, uh, considerations, I guess, to sort of help their experience feel respected and, and um that will help with their consolidation of the experience. Mm, mm. Now, Marg, we could talk for hours. We, we have spoken for many hours. We've spoken on the phone for quite a few times, which is amazing. Um, what, where, where would you like to see this um, go perhaps in within five years? Like where are you? Maybe, maybe we could talk about some of the work you're specifically doing as opposed to some of the stuff that's going on in the world. Where, where would you like to see your work um, head in, uh, in a couple of years? Um, my, my personal work or just maybe the broader picture? Uh, well, well let, let, let's, uh, what do you like? <laughs> yeah, I like both. <laughs> I, I could go another four hours on the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so look, I think where am I? I'm hoping that looking within five years, I hope that our study has helped all the patients that have, that have come through to some degree, um, and, uh, help them face their death with more peace and, mm. um, if I feel that we can do that, then I feel like we've done something um, very important, um, not only for them but for their families um, because that experience stays with them, how people kind of die. And I think so hopefully, yeah, that that's contributed to the, the literature in some way. I do hope that, that you know, and look, the US, the streets ahead of us in the UK as well and Europe, that it's it's if it's not already um, and approved medicine that it's that it's hurtling towards that. Um, I suspect it probably will be for depression. Um, if things continue to track the way they are, don't want to jump the gun. Um, but yeah, obviously for our terminally ill, I would love to see that this is a treatment that we can offer them, and perhaps in a, a setting that's, you know, um, and while we take a lot of care to to make sure that our treatment room, it's called the retreat, um, looks beautiful and it's like a not looking like a, a hospital room at all. It's uh, very ambient and subdued lighting and there's art and it's pretty and it's kind of inviting and it doesn't smell like alcohol or like, you know, rubbing alcohol. And yeah. Stuff. Or chemical. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it feels at homely, but, but I do think that some people may not want the, the four white walls of a hospital in order yep. to access this treatment. And I guess where I'd like to sort of see it ahead is that I do hope that, we can develop a cultural and existential maturity around these compounds because I think that, you know, looking back and how, you know, in Indigenous use, inappropriate use was really frowned upon. It's that they had a cultural understanding of and respect and reverence, I guess, for these medicines. Mm-hmm. I'd like us to see that. I think you hit on a really important point before in that, you know, one of our dominant tendencies in the West is that we want something, we want it now. We want into suffering right now without reading the fine print and we'll just hurtle into it with, without kind of... Um, understanding that that can undo things. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can move as a group in a cultural way to, to understanding, um, you know, th- these, these are serious, these are amazing uh, compounds and medicines, um, but to, to respect them. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that happens, it would be wonderful to be able to see uh like that compounds and, and plant medicines used for wellness, not just disorder. I, I mm. do want hope that that happens. I, I don't know how um, well that will be received by, by some of my research counterparts, but I would hope that that is something that that we continue to sort of um, understand these compounds and 
mature to a point where we have a, a cultural understanding of our own mm. of, of how to 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 use these um, medicines mm. in a in, in a therapeutic way and not an um, uh, indulgent way in that. Way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, that's a such a brilliant way to finish. It's just started raining heavily here. I'm not sure if you guys can hear the sunshine here now. Yeah, how good is that? There you go. Perfect timing. <laughs> who, needed a, who, who needed a timestamp? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Thank, thank you so much for. I knew, um, you know, this was just going to be amazing, and um, I, I really do you know, have to thank you so much for putting your hand up and, and bringing this stuff to Australia because it's just so important. And it's, uh, it's so great to, to speak to someone that, uh, you know, is, is, is really dedicated to, to the work they're doing and open-minded enough to, um, you know, dance on the border between, you know, being responsible and clinical, but also on the other side, um, having a look at some of the ramifications that this could bring. So thank you so much for the work you're doing, Mark. And, um, um, I can't wait to chat to you again. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you. I feel like, uh, yeah, we could talk for hours, couldn't we? <laughs> but thank yeah. you again. Thank you for your interest and support of our work too. Mm. Thank you. How, how can people support you? Where, where pe- can people find you? Is there a link that you'd like to, to give people? Or? <laughs> Funnily enough, I watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix oh. and deleted all my social. Oh, amazing. <laughs> That's a crazy documentary, <laughs> isn't it? I know. I was oh, God. So now I was on Twitter. I'm no longer... No longer on the ship, but you can. Well, you can get. I'm hard to get to, but that's not. Um, it's more just because we're sort of getting thumped with inquiries. But the mm-hmm. the um, best way would be uh, email psilocybin study at svha.org.au. So it's um, oh. psilocybin study, all one word, at svha, which stands for St. Vincent's Health Australia, dot org dot au. And again, it's hard to sort of personally respond to all the emails, but but we do read them as a team. We're able to um, uh, clasp eyes on everything that, that comes through. So, but um, but yeah, I I I hear I get I do get a lot of emails. And if anyone out there has sort of emailed in terms of your your questions or, or about when this is coming, it is coming. There's going to be more announcements coming in the in the coming months. And hang in there. Um, just take good care of yourselves. Um, I know that that it has a lot of promise, but just keep looking after yourselves and 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 getting good support in in the meantime and alongside. Mm. So. Absolutely. Mark, thank you so much again for jumping on the show. We, uh, we went nearly two hours there, which is awesome. It really oh flew God. there. So we did well. We did really well. Hope I haven't made you late for anything. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm, um, yeah, it's uh, luckily enough. I haven't, um, no, I'm not, not on the board today. I'm actually at home today. Nice. This it looks, it looks very nice. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, as I said, this is one that I wa- have been wanting to do for such a long time and it dis- did not disappoint. Um, it was amazing. So, uh, yeah, guys, thanks so much for listening. I'll speak to you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.